It's a great pleasure to be here. I thank you for your hospitality and for the hospitality of this great university. I've been traveling in Australia uh, for weeks now. This is, I guess, my, my last and fourth week uh, here. Uh, and uh, I've been in Sydney, I've been in Melbourne, I've been in North Queensland, and finally here in Canberra. It's just been a wonderful experience, and I'm grateful uh, to have had the chance. Um, the title that Adam uh, gave you is a bit misleading, or uh, uh, that is to say that um, uh, I'm guilty of some false advertising because the subject that I'm going to talk about is actually a little broader than um, the one that I originally gave to Adam. Um, and I, I, it's somewhat unwieldy title, but this is what I want to talk about more, more broadly about a, an empirical study of um, attitudes public attitudes regarding various issues in bribery. Um, and I'm going to focus at the end on what I think is a particularly interesting issue and a particularly puzzling issue and a particularly important one in light of uh, current public policy. So um, in an earlier work um, that I published a few years ago, I offered a normative and conceptual analysis that explored the underlying moral content of a number of white collar offenses and white collar crime more generally, um, focusing on the sometimes fine line that exists between various forms of white collar criminality and lawful, if aggressive, behavior of various sorts. Um, so for example, I looked at the distinction between fraud and sharp dealing, tax evasion and tax avoidance, perjury versus wiliness on the witness stand, insider trading versus savvy investing, bribery versus horse trading. Those, those concepts that have great consequences in criminal law in terms of uh, whether an uh, offender is going to be prosecuted at all, whether there's going to be punishment um, uh, assigned, um, but often turn on very fine kinds of distinctions, fine moral distinctions that we make um, between what's lawful and, and, and what's, what's not. Um, in several follow-up uh, articles to the book, I worked with a social psychologist uh, in the United States named Matthew Kugler, um, trying to basically test public attitudes about a number of the issues that, we dealt, that, that I dealt with in the book uh, some years before. And uh, we wanted to know whether people's attitudes were consistent or inconsistent both with the law as it exists, mostly in the United States, although also, also uh, more generally in, uh, in, in the Western world. Um, and also consistent with the, the theory that I uh, put forth in the book, which sometimes was consistent with what the law is and sometimes departed from that. Now, I'm not going to talk now about why citizen intuitions really matter. Um, I've written about that elsewhere, and I'm, I'm happy to take questions on it. I mean, just very, very briefly, the notion is that society's ability to enforce compliance with the law lies less in the power to impose sanctions than it does in the norms by which people direct their lives. So when the law is inconsistent with what people's moral attitudes are, then that, that poses a problem in terms of enforcement, it poses a problem in terms of legitimacy, and so forth. So the, the, the goal here is just to try to find out, well, what do people really think about some of these hard issues in white collar crime? Where would they draw the line between what should be treated as a crime, what shouldn't, and uh, where they think it should be treated as a crime, how would they uh, sanction it or punish it? All right, so um, the focus today is going to be on bribery and uh, five issues in particular that I want to talk about, although I'm going to spend um, more time talking about the last than the first four. So the first is um, we wanted to see what, how people's attitudes would um, be affected where we change the value, the, the, the thing of value that was taken by the bribe. And I'll explain what that means in a moment. So, second, we wanted to see the difference between um, uh, the bribees change, uh, performing an official act versus his or her performing an unofficial act. Third, we distinguish between quid pro quo bribes versus gratuities accepted by the bribee. Uh, and fourth, taking uh, we, we distinguish between taking and sol or soliciting a bribe on the one hand versus giving or offering a bribe. And finally, we distinguish between official bribery, bribes that are given to government officials versus bribes that are given to commercial actors in one uh, context or another. All right. So um, in order to do the study, we used a very useful research tool called Mecha Amazon Mechanical Turk. 
Um, I'm happy to answer questions about what our methodology w was. Basically, we got a pretty good cross-section of uh, adult Americans to answer a number of uh, questions arising out of various hypotheticals that we gave them, um, in which we asked people to rank the blameworthiness of various acts. We asked them to determine whether the act should be treated, uh, punished as a crime or not, uh, and we asked them to, to say how much and how seriously they would punish the crime. So um, we uh, obtained, as I say, a pretty good cross-section of people in terms of uh, basic demographics, race, gender, age, educational level, ide ideological or self-reported ideological orientation. We also asked certain screening questions that we thought were pertinent to the issue of bribery, um, including whether they had ever held public office or held a position of responsibility at a, at a large firm. Uh, or worked at a company with a gifts policy or been involved in lobbying or had even given money to a political candidate. Um, we didn't find much ver significant difference in terms of demographics. That is to say, we didn't find any, any real identifiable, at least with respect to this study, we've done some other studies where there were more differences, but we didn't find any real differences in terms of how men versus women view these issues or people of different ages or educational level or even their ideological um, uh, bent. All right, so what I want to do is quickly walk through the various questions that we asked. Um, I'm not going to talk in any detail about why the subjects had the, the, um, uh, the responses that they had. Instead, I'm going to wait until we get to talk about commercial bribery versus official bribery to get into more detail about some of the uh, rationale behind their judgments. So the first question involved a variation in the thing of value accepted by the office holder. And we, di we, we distinguish four different kinds of things of value that might be given to an office holder uh, that constitute a bribe. The first would just be cash. And uh, we gave you a picture from um, uh, Representative uh, William Jefferson, who was a, uh, Louisiana, a U.S. Senator from New Orleans, who several years ago was prosecuted and convicted of bribe, accepting bribes. This is the money that he, this is where he kept the money. Rather than putting it under the mattress, he put it in the freezer. Um, I guess you could say it was cold cash. The second, um, the second item that would be offered to the bribee would be uh, a service. Rather than cash, it would be a valuable service. In this case, this was a summer home. I guess you could call it summer. It was a weekend home anyway of Senator, Senator Ted Stevens, who, who was the senator from Alaska who was alleged to have accepted various favors in the form of renovations to his weekend house, um, allegedly in return for um, uh, giving political favors. The, the, the prosecution was uh, extraordinarily botched. It was one of the most botched federal prosecutions we've ever seen. The, the government eventually had to vacate, the, the, the judgment against Stevens was vacated. Stevens then had the misfortune of dying in a plane crash. Um, I think a lot of people view it as a really dark, dark, dark day for the U.S. Department of Justice in terms of bringing the case. But nevertheless, the underlying facts seem pretty clear that Stevens had accepted some, uh, something of value in return for an official act. The third, uh, the third official, th uh, uh, the third thing given to the official was a campaign contribution, and. Um, in the U.S., as you know, we have virtually unregulated campaign contributions. So a lot of people give a lot of money, in this case the Koch brothers, and, the, and they've never been accused of committing a crime, but they certainly have been accused of giving a lot of money to the Republican Party, many, many millions of dollars. The question is, if they had given money in return for some specific favor, would that be, uh, how, would that be how would that be judged in relation to these other things of value? And finally, the fourth thing of value that we imagined was endorsement by someone whose uh, endorsement would matter. In this case, we just imagined just as a, as a hypothetical, if um, um, Oprah Winfrey, the famous American uh, talk show host and business entrepreneur who famously endorsed Barack Obama and really made him into a viable candidate when he ran four years ago, if just hypothetically, and of course this is just just imagining a hypothetical, if she had received something of value specifically in return for her very valuable endorsement, how would people judge that? And here's what people had to say. Oh. Okay, well, I'm not going to go through the hypotheticals that we used. Um, 
but basically we gave a hypothetical which varied only with respect to a particular detail, namely what was given to the official in return for an official act, and here was the result that we got. So um, when the person offered money to the candidate, 96% of our uh, respondents said that that should be treated as a crime. When the person offered uh, the ser services in the form of home, re home renovations, slightly less, 92% said that that should be treated as a crime. But when the person offered a campaign contribution to the campaign rather than to the candidate, money given to the campaign rather than to the candidate personally, a substantially smaller number, but still a signif significant number, said that should be treated as a crime, 73%. And finally, when the person offered an endorsement rather than uh, something of economic value, uh, a, a relatively small number of people said that that should be treated as a crime, 37%. Okay, so that was the first question, that, the first issue that we looked at. The second issue that we looked at was uh, from the perspective of the person who is receiving the bribe, two different variables here. We distinguish between the bribees performing an official act, and that would be the classic case of bribery. In this case, I gave you a, uh, a mayor from New Jersey who was accused of accepting money in return for doing favors, political favors for the, to the, for the briber versus performing what we might call an, an unofficial act, because the, bribe sta the bribery statute in the U.S. covers only uh, the performance of an official act in return for money. In this case, we imagined, we tried to think, well, what would an unofficial act be? And one possibility is that an unofficial act is an, an endorsement. Now, we don't have any case law on that. The issue's never really been presented to a court, but I think it's an interesting issue. If, if a candidate or an office holder agreed to endorse someone in return for um, money that was given, would that be regarded as a bribe? In this case, this is uh, Maxine Waters, who's a congress, congresswoman from California, who is alleged to have basically sold her endorsement. Um, and uh, she hasn't yet been prosecuted, but uh, apparently there's some investigation into her conduct, which may or may not lead to a criminal investigation. So we asked people to compare the giving of money in return for an official act versus the giving of money in return for an official act. And here's what they said. I'm not going to go through the hypotheticals, but these are the data that we got. Where the person, and you can see the distinction here between the red line and the blue line. No, sorry. Um, yeah, the red line and the blue line. The red shows that the money was given in return for an official act. The blue, the blue bar indicates that the money was given in return for an unofficial act, in this case an endorsement. So it was quite close um, when the person was offered money. When the person was offered money in return for an official act, 96%, as I said before, said that that should be treated as a crime. When the person offered money in return for an endorsement, 90% still said that that should be treated as a crime. There was a little more of a discrepancy when we got to offering the home renovations. Um, here, <coughs> substantially larger numbers said that offering home, re home renovations in return for an official act should be treated as a crime in comparison to offering the money in return for the unofficial act. And you can, you can read the rest of the results. Now, the results there are, are really at odds with the law in the United States because the law in the United States makes a sharp distinction between offering money in return for an official act versus offering money in return for an official act. Offering money in return for an official, unofficial act is not a crime at all. It's completely immune, if you will, from any, any criminal uh, enforcement. So it's striking, I think, that 90% of the people said that offering money in return for an endorsement should be regarded as a crime. Arguably, that's at odds with current law. Okay, the third issue that we looked at was uh, the, uh, an important difference in U.S. law, probably not as important in, under Australian law, which is the difference between bribes and gratuities. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I don't think it might be as relevant to you all as it is in the U.S., but the basic distinction is a bribe is said to require a particular form of mental element. It requires an, an intent to uh, influence the person in the conduct, the influence the office holder in the conduct in the office holder's conduct of his or her office. It's a quid pro quo. I'm giving you something in return for an official act. But the US law also has the concept of gratuity. It's basically a gift given to a public official. I'm not giving you the gift in return for an official act. I'm giving you the gift because 
I want to say thanks for voting the way, I, I, the way you voted. I want to say thanks for the act that you performed. And um, so we wanted, to, we wanted to find whether people, and, and the distinction in US law is important because the punishment for a bribe, a quid pro quo uh, donation, if you will, or gift, is very substantial. It's a 15 year penalty. But the, the penalty for a gratuity under the federal statute is only two years. So we thought that it, it was worth looking at people's attitudes to see whether people would agree that there was such a significant distinction. Uh, okay, I'm not going to go through the scenarios, but I'll show you the, the results. And 96% um, of people said that uh, when the bribe was received by a government actor, uh, when it was a bribe, when it satisfied the quid pro quo requirement, as our hypothetical laid out, then that should be regarded as a crime. However, when we got to gratuities, gifts, as opposed to quid pro quo bribes, there was a substantial drop off. Only 63% said that the gratuity should be treated as a crime, uh, as a crime when the office holder was planning to stay in office. So we, we distinguish between cases where the office holder would be staying on in office and cases where the office holder was about to retire. 63% uh, said that it should be a crime when the person was staying on in office and a slightly less number, 51%, said that it should be treated as a crime when the office holder was planning to retire shortly. Now the reason that distinction mattered was because sometimes people give gifts to an office holder with the expectation that, well, even though I'm not, I'm, I haven't given you a bribe with respect to this particular transaction, it won't be long before something comes up and I'll need a favor from you and so I'm going to give you this gift sort of prospectively. Um, but if the person is actually retiring, then arguably that wouldn't be the case. It would, it would really be a gift in the true sense of the term. Okay. Uh, quickly, taking versus giving a bribe. We wanted to know that because the federal statute in the U.S., as under Australian law, treats the taking of a bribe by the office holder just the same as the giving of a bribe to the office holder. We wanted to know whether there was any distinction there. We had the idea that maybe it's worse to take a bribe than it is to give a bribe because after all, the person who takes the bribe is the person who is violating a duty to his or her office or to the people or whoever his constituency is in such uh, office. And uh, so we wanted to see if there was any distinction that people would make there. We imagine two different cases, one in which someone accepts a bribe of $20,000 in the other case, a person gives a bribe of the same amount. Uh, and here's the data that we found. Interestingly, um, almost, almost identical percentage of subjects said that giving a bribe should be treated as a crime as said uh, receiving a bribe should be treated as a crime. No distinction there. So that was consistent with American law and inconsistent with the theory that I had uh, articulated earlier in my, in my book. All right. Now getting to the issue that I want to spend the rest of the talk focusing on, bribery of public officials versus commercial bribery. Um, well, what's going on here? Well, traditionally, um, the focus of bribery law has been on the bribery of government officials. Um, if you look at the Bible, it talks about bribery of a judge. Um, in more recent history, we've expanded that notion to include legislators and executive branch officials. But the focus has always, the core of bribery has always been on the idea that the person who's taking the bribe is somehow breaching a governmental function, breaching a duty which is in some respects owed to the people or whatever the person's political constituency is. And it's only relatively recently and only in limited ways that we've seen the extension of the notion of bribery to private bribery, to bribery that's given to officials in a commercial setting. So someone, say, who's a buyer for a department store who accepts money uh, in return for um, uh, agreeing to stock or buy a, a, a particular vendor's uh, brand, that traditionally has fallen outside the scope of bribery law, even though in a loose sense we might say that the buyer for the department store has taken a bribe or the person who's given the money to the buyer has given a bribe. So we wanted to know whether people, how people would uh, view that distinction. Now, um, at this, uh, in, in recent years, we've seen a, a significant expansion in the willingness of 
law to focus on commercial bribery. And the most uh, significant um, place where that's occurred is the recent UK Bribery Act of 2010. And this is a really an extraordinary law in many ways, um, but on this point it's extraordinary because the UK Bribery Act makes no distinction at all between governmental bribery, that bribes that are given to governmental officials, and bribes that are given to private employees in commercial firms. There's no distinction that's made there. It's, they're treated the same. They're not, they're not distinguished for purposes of the statute. In the U.S., that, that's a very un, that would be regarded as very unusual. I submit in Australia, it would be considered very unusual as well. We just don't do it. In the U.S., we have certain specialized statutes that apply to, so, uh, to bribery in the commercial context. Sometimes they're specific to a particular industry. For example, if you give money to a disc jockey on the ra uh, playing uh, records on the radio, um, that, was a, that became a federal offense in the 1950s. It was called payola. And there are other specific industries that uh, have been, um, in which bribery has been criminalized. Texas is one of the few states that has a generalized, comprehensive commercial bribery statute. Strictly speaking, or technically, if you read the Texas statute, it's broad enough to apply to any bribe that's given in a commercial context, although it's, it's not a very frequently prosecuted offense. It remains to be seen really what the effect of the UK Bribery Act is going to be. I think there are a lot of executives around the world and a lot of government officials around the world who are sort of scratching their heads and wondering how much do we need to worry about the UK Bribery Act? How, how, how strong, strongly will UK authorities enforce this law when it comes to commercial, um, when it comes to commercial firms? All right, so we came up with another story um, involving this virtually the same transaction, but in one case the person who received the bribe was a government official, in the other case the person who received the bribe was a board member of a large private corporation, and here are the results that we found. The person who received, let's see, if you have to compare the red to the blue bars, the blue bar shows the government, the, when the bribe was received by a government official, 96% said that that should be treated as a crime. When the bribe was given to a corporate official, 80% said that the, recip the receipt of the bribe should be regarded as a, uh, as a crime. So there's some distinction there, 96 versus 80%, but still a very substantial percentage of people said that the commercial bribe should be treated as a crime. Uh, somewhat at odds with Australian law, somewhat at odds with American law, arguably cons more consistent with UK law. So the question is why? I mean, why do people have the intuitions that they have? Is taking a bribe in the commercial context uh, as wrong as taking a bribe in the governmental context? Is it as harmful? I mean, how should we, how should we approach it? The, uh, the UK, uh, Eng the Law Commission of, of England and Wales, which uh, drafted the law which Parliament uh, subsequently adopted, um, was very much focused on the, the fact that, the that commercial and uh, governmental or public and private kinds of functions have become blurred. That seemed to be the focus of their analysis. So for example, um, in, in, in the United States, we now have had the, gov the, the many um, private firms have now taken over what used to be governmental functions. So policing, for example, or pr running prisons used to be an exclusively governmental function. It's now been taken over by uh, private firms to some extent. We used to have a mail service in the United States that was fairly reliable. Um, it's become essentially a joke and we now have commercial firms, uh, UPS and FedEx and so forth that have really have, have, have uh, taken over from the uh, U.S. Postal Service. Schools in the United States uh, used to be considered a public education was really in some respects the, the, the crown jewel of American democracy, the idea of a public education available to everyone. A lot of that's been taken over by private schools in many respects. And of course, even the military um, functions in the U.S. operations abroad have been taken over by um, private firms who are, have been contracted by the Defense Department. By the same token, a lot of what used to be an exclusively governmental function has been, if not taken over by the government, at least is heavily regulated. There's a lot of government involvement. So our, when, when our banks failed in the wake of the 2000 fiscal crisis, um, we had the bank, bank bailout, the TARP bailout. Here are the, 
the, sub, the object of um, Bart Simpson's enmity. Um, our, our health insurance system, uh, famously and infamously private um, since the dawn of time, has been to some extent uh, federalized under recent legislation. Whether that legislation will survive, survive Supreme Court scrutiny remains to be seen. When our automobile manufacturers were failing in 2008, the government moved in and bailed out the automobile industry with some considerable success. So the point is that regardless of whether these policy initiatives are good or bad, there's been a blurring of, of public and private functions here. What used to be viewed exclusively as public is now often taken over by private actors. What used to be a private uh, concern only has to some extent been um, at least very heavily regulated and in some respects taken over by the, by the government. So what are we to make of that? Does that mean that we no longer need to distinguish between public bribery and private bribery? Does that mean that the UK Bribery Act is the right approach? Well, I'm not so sure. Um, I do think that there is a qualitative difference between bribery in the public sphere and bribery in the, in, in, in the private sphere. I, I think, first of all, the harms are different. Um, it's true that multinational firms can cause great harms in terms of, uh, in terms of their activities and their global reach. Um, but um, the, 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 the nature of the harm is different. I mean, when the harm comes from a governmental actor, I think that we view that differently from those harms which come from private actors as, as pervasive and, and uh, significant as the harms are from private actors. Even more significant is the difference in, in wrongfulness. Uh, those who hold public office have duties that are qualitatively different from those held by employees of private firms. In a democracy, they typically hold their jobs either because they were directly chosen by the people or because they were appointed by elected representatives and they serve at the pleasure, pleasure of, those, uh, of those people. So we talk about people being charged with serving or protecting or preserving or defending the public interest and doing so faithfully and truly. To accept a bribe is to violate that trust, to betray one's office and the people, to, mit, to commit what we might even call a kind of, metaphorically, a kind of treason. Now, people who take bribes in the commercial sphere, of course, they violate their duties, their fiduciary duties, or other employee duties that they have to their companies, and that's nothing to sneeze about. I mean, I certainly think that there, there's a good argument for prosecuting, uh, treating and prosecuting some acts of commercial bribery as uh, as a crime. But I think there's a qualitative difference between bribery in the com commercial sphere and bribery in the private sphere and we, that we ought to protect that distinction. We ought not just to sort of um, uh, wave it away by treating them uh, the same as is done under the UK Bribery Act. Now, um, it is true Well, uh, uh, another point on bribery in the private sphere. Bribery in the private sphere sometimes <coughs> reflects just the practices of a given industry. Just to take a trivial example, um, actually this is an example that doesn't play that well in Australia because you don't have a culture of tipping, um, which I've learned since I've, every time I've given money to a waiter or something, I get a big smile and, you know, and like, what's wrong with you? So, um, but in the U.S., we have a culture of tipping. You give money to the person who serves you dinner or the person who carries your bags or the person who gives you a ride in the taxi. And in a sense, a, a tip is a kind of bribe or it's certainly a gratuity. Um, but you have to look to the particular culture. You have to look to the particular industry. You have to look to the particulars of the, the normative structure that surrounds a given practice to know whether a gift of that sort is considered to be um, permissible or not. In the private sphere, there's a lot of variation. Um, in some industries, in the real estate industry, for example, in the um, in, 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 uh, auto repair business, insurance industry, there are practices that look a lot like bribes. People work on commission. People are responsive to gifts and other payments that they receive. But we don't expect to see that. So we really have to look at industry by industry to determine whether those practices are permissible or not. But in the government context, it's, it's, it's almost unthinkable, at least from our Western perspective, that you should be giving money to government officials. Now, of course, there are societies where that exists. There are societies where 
you know, you really can't get your, you can't get the police to respond to your call unless you pay some money under the table. But I think in a Western democracy, we consider that to be quite perverse or corrupt even. Um, that's not generally the way we think public servants should act. Public servants should receive decent salaries, but they shouldn't receive money on the side to provide special service to citizens. They owe the same duties to all citizens um, equally. So again, there's a qualitative difference. There's much more variation, I think, in the private sphere than we find in the public sphere. Now, that's not to say that these, the blurring of the public and private uh, sectors isn't significant. Certainly there are cases where um, what used to be a private function has become a governmental function, and I have really no problem in treating those as public bribery. So if a, um, if a prison guard or a warden who works for a private prison firm is taking money under the table in order to provide certain services, there's no reason at all not to treat that as a governmental function given that the government has deputized the private firm to serve that function. Um, by the same token, though, where a, uh, and, and there may be cases where a governmental, a governmental actor is providing a, a, a private function, um, but, uh, and, and where a governmental actor acts in a proprietary role, um, it doesn't follow that we should treat that as a private act. It's still a governmental actor who is performing that formerly proprietary uh, function. So there's not a necessarily a symmetry there. Nevertheless, and I'm going to conclude with this, I think that um, even though there are cases where there's been a blurring of the private and the public functions, and I think we really would need empirical study, and maybe some of you have some expertise in the area to say how extensive that blurring has become. There are certainly cases where we can draw, we can still from an empirical perspective draw a pretty sharp distinction and say this is a governmental function, this is a function that's being provided by the government versus another function that's being provided exclusively by a private actor. And where we can do that, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't continue to distinguish between public uh, and private. To conflate them, to treat them as, as indistinguishable from each other, I think ultimately loses an important moral and uh, qualitative aspect of, uh, of, uh, of our criminal justice system. So I'm going to stop there. I think that's pretty much in time. And uh, take any questions that people have. That's great, Stuart. Thank you very much.